And I asked him, I said, so what possessed you to make a steamer? And he said, well, this is what I did. And he told me about spraying the hay with water. And he told me about everything. Then he said, I think he said it was a taco place or something. He said, I seen him steam the tortillas. That was interesting to me how he came up with that because he tried everything I'd done. You know, a farmer just trying to make something work and it made it work. Just taking my boys over to look at it and to see and see what inventions are out there. Part of it was the, the interest I had in trying to solve the problem and hearing about something that just made sense and it just tasted good. And so when you went over to look at it, as you took your boys out there, it didn't take long to analyze it and say, this is it, he's got it figured out. It just happened. We had decided to go ahead and build some of these for the next season. So these five operations came, visited us, watched it work. What is most amazing to me is I told them, I said, you know, the, the problem is, is I don't have any money to build these. So in order for me to build these, I'm, I'm gonna need half of the money for this, these machines up front in order to start the process. It was super interesting and it was another one of those miracles of the whole starting of this whole project was that these guys that did not know me personally, except Don Roberts knew, knew about me more because he's here closer, but they actually trusted this guy that had built this machine, that if they gave me, I think it was like $75,000 or $80,000 up front, they would actually get a machine down the road, you know, when we got them finished. I am so humbled by that experience that for some reason, I don't know how they did it or how they trusted this could happen, but they did. I knew it would happen. And somehow they knew that I knew that they knew it would happen or something because it, it, it just came together. They sent their money. We got all the parts ordered and it was, it was a crude method of inventory and of acquisition of parts and all that stuff, but we did it. When I first looked at a steamer, I, I know very clearly how much my first steamer was. And I was like, holy smoke, that's a lot of money for a steamer. But when you've tried everything and nothing's worked, yeah, the investment was heavy then. I felt like it was extremely high. But in return, I paid for that steamer in one crop. When I got my, all my hay got put up green and everybody else's was black, that paid for itself in one crop. So really, in my opinion, a steamer will pay for itself over and over again, the lifetime of the steamer by far, versus the cost of it. I mean, the extra machinery you don't have to run, and most importantly, just the quality of hay that you get to put up with it. We thought we were gonna have these machines all done by the spring of 2009, and we had lots of problems. We had problems with our plastic manufacturer. We had lots of things came up, and it was, it stretched out clear through that next summer. These guys were still like, oh, let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. So they missed that first season of 2009. And we got the machines all done and delivered by the very end of the baling season. It was late October, early November even, and down in New Mexico, that's where we first baled hay with one of them for Doug Whitney. That was one of the original buyers in November of 2009. My very first steamer that I got, actually we shipped the baler from here down to Cedar City because it was the first recutter baler that they made the hardware for. So he built the hardware down there and then we went to school down there because he put a school on it. I think there was like six or seven of us in that school that first time. And so my baler and steamer was the one down there during the school. And then oh, uh, 
Dave turned around and he shipped it all back up to oh, uh, Agri-Service there in Burling. And then they kind of put it all back together for me and they kind of thought I was an idiot owning a steamer. They told me, I don't know what you're doing. I don't think that's gonna work. But oh, uh, they was pretty shocked when, oh, uh, when it worked and it put out the quality and the beautiful hay that come out of it. I don't, in fact, I don't even think we had a shop when we first built them, was to build, build them out on the ground. <laughs> I sold my sheep in about 2004 and we, we built a shop and then that was a better place to work. But before that, we didn't really have a shop. So this thing was developed out in the backyard, basically. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of changes at Staley West. I mean, it's amazing um, to drive by this hay barn down here and to imagine us building the first ones in that hay barn. It's amazing to see how it went from a hay barn and to the early customers who really took a chance on us by giving us half the money up front to get their machine. As soon as we released this to these guys and they got using it in their operations in 2010, um, the neighbors started watching a lot of the neighbors started criticizing, saying you're nuts doing something like this, putting steam on hay, you're gonna ruin it. So they had a lot of naysayers, but they had a lot of interest also, and everybody started watching them. And by just early in that summer that year, there were 10 more people that wanted steamers. And so that kind of just started this ball rolling. Now we didn't have anywhere to build these steamers except for we had a hay barn, where we did most of the assembly out in the hay barn. And then we had a farm shop that we, that we had converted from a sheep shed. So we did a lot of it in there too. But we were able to, to get through uh, making all these first ones work, then the second 10. And by the end of that next year of 2011, we had 15 steamers out there working and people loved them. And it was mostly myself and Hans and then my two sons, Dallin and Kendall. And by this time, I think if I recall correctly, I had actually brought on Spencer Douglas to help keep my books and everything because I was also trying to be an accountant at the same time I was doing websites, designing, electronics, the marketing, all those things, you know, so I needed to hand off some stuff. When I was in high school, I kind of ran my dad's farm. My, my dad's passion is actually to fix stuff up and, and resell it. He'll buy stuff cheap, fix it up, sell it. That was what he was really good at. He was not a great farmer and I was really passionate about the farm. So Spencer was a farm kid from up in Vernon and he was, Spencer's like a little kid. If he sees a tractor and especially if he sees something new, he's going nuts over it. And even a, you know, 12, 13 years old, I started doing a lot of kind of the more heavy duty stuff, running equipment and things on the farm. And because of that, I was reading a ton. I was reading a lot of stuff, uh, magazine articles about hay and forage. And the actual magazine, Hay and Forage magazine, ran an article in, I want to say it was 98, 1998. I read an article about a guy in southern Utah who had come up with this crazy idea to put steam on hay and they actually had pictures and they'd done a whole story on it and I was fascinated. I was like, that is so cool. I want that and I could use that. That's something that we could really use because the valley where I grew up, where we were baling hay, was kind of like Cedar City. It's hot and dry in the summer. It gets really windy and we deal with a little bit of the monsoon moisture flow that kind of just wreaks havoc with anybody who's trying to make hay. And this whole thought of I could go out and bale almost any time of day really sunk in long before I ever met Dave when I was a kid in high school. I came to school here at SUU in Cedar City and I was kind of homesick for the farm. So I started driving around the valley and I was like, oh, wow, look, there's a, there's a big hay farm. And I literally helped myself right onto this very spot where we're filming. 
Nobody knew who I was. Nobody gave me permission. I start driving around. I'm like, oh, wow, look, they got a nice swath there. Oh, look, there's a baler. And I was like, what's that? It was the prototype steamer that Dave had been working on. I saw that prototype. I probably wasn't supposed to. <laughs> I kind of helped myself back off the farm and I was like, gosh, I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but I was just like, they're doing that. They're doing this thing. Like they're, it's legit. This thing's moving forward. And I, it kind of was that spark from 98 that I'd kind of initially seen the machine. And in 2001, you know, three years later, I'm like, dude, they're actually doing this. They're moving forward. And then it kind of fell by the wayside again. Life happens. I'm finishing school. I go off to Las Vegas, come back home. Here, it was 2009 when I started working um, at Hinton Burdick in Cedar City here. He had been thinking about this. He was an accountant, worked for, um, for Hinton Burdick here in town, who was our accounting company. And then they ran another article in Hay and Forge magazine. And I took that article to the manager at Hinton Burdick and I said, hey, this is our client. He's doing this, this is cool. We should tell everybody about this. And he was like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, well, I've heard of Dave, I know this, whatever. You know, it was this kind of brushed off and I was like, no, this is really cool stuff. One morning, I just happened to be at the very front of the office in, in Hinton Burdick. I was up front faxing some papers and Dave walked through the front door. And I didn't know it was Dave. I just said, hey, how you doing? I'm Spencer, how can I help you? I'm David Staley. And I was like, hey, you're the steamer guy. And he was just like, well, I didn't know that. You know, he's kind of his normal muted kind of not so showy self. He's just not like that. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm Dave. I, yeah, we're working on some stuff. And I said, no, that thing is awesome. I know about that. And I said, what are you doing with it? And he said, we're baling hay with it. In fact, tomorrow, tonight I'm gonna go bale hay. And I said, I wanna see it. I just, I have to see this thing. I just said, please let me come out and bale hay with you. I just gotta see this. And he said, well, come on out. So I was baling hay on the Howard Nelson farm over off Minersville Highway here in the valley this one day. And, and here shows up Spencer Douglas climbs on the tractor with me, and he's just all Google-eyed about this whole thing. And this was with this next generation of machine. And he said, Dave, I've been watching you since I was a little teenage kid when you first came out with those older machines and there was an article in the Hay and Forage magazine. He said, I have been like curious about this ever since. And I've actually driven around the valley while I was going to school at Southern Utah University later to become an accountant, he says, I've watched you from the road. I go, wow, <laughs> got a stalker here. Now he's sitting in the tractor with me. We talked about a hundred things under the sun, honestly. We talked about how the machine kind of came forth, the idea where it came from, his lack of desire to be a great big business, a manufacturing company, the the fact that he's extremely passionate about farming would probably much rather farm than actually run a manufacturing company and build dozens and maybe hundreds of these machines a year and we kind of chatted about that and he just asked me a lot of questions like where you come from what's your background and everything like that and I mean before the night was over there wasn't less than 10 times that I was just like can I come work for you I just want to be a part of this. Like, I want to quit my job now and come work, work on this with you. I want to do this. Spencer said, I want to put together like a little business plan for you about what I know about your company and what I think I could bring to the table for you. And he's a, he's a professional. He's in the, in the accounting field already. Good job, good paying job. And there's this guy making this little steamer looking at moving forward with this commercialization, which we had started that process already. And this guy's gonna give up his career. He wants to, to come to work for me, <laughs> who has no employees yet. And uh, he has little kids, he has a wife, he's got a family to provide for. And I said, okay, we'll write it up. 
I came to Dave about a week later and I said, look, there's not a doubt in my mind I want to be a part of this, but I'm scared. Like, I can't leave my public accounting job. This is, this is like going from one thing in life to a completely different thing in life. And he said, don't worry, I'm scared too. I've never been, he's like, I've kind of been self-employed, but he said, really, my career, my life here at the farm has been at the farm. The one thing that he said that I thought was just absolutely kind of cool was he said, you know, you get an old milk cow and she's a good milk cow. You know, when I was a kid, we used to milk a cow. And I said, I actually did that too for a while. <laughs> and he said, you get this old milk cow, if you milk her dry every day, and just take everything that she can give you, she'll bring everything back tomorrow and you'll have just as much, if not more tomorrow. And he said, but if you only take a little bit out each day and you don't totally take everything that she has to give, you'll probably only get that much. And eventually, if you don't take it enough, she'll just dry up and she won't give you any more. And he said, I kind of feel that's what Staley West might end up being. We're going to have to go for it. How can we apply that to life? You know, you've got to take everything that you can and throw everything that you've got at it and go kind of all in, so to speak, not recklessly, but go all in and dedicate yourself to it. And that really stuck with me because I was really vacillating between should I be an accountant or could I actually pull this off? He came out with a little binder, all organized, and he had written up kind of a business plan. I, I technically wanted to call, if I was gonna hire him, I'd call him a business manager so he could take care of a lot of the purchasing, receiving, books, all those kind of things, taxes, all that. And he said, you know, some developments have kind of happened. I think I've got, you know, two or three more of these sold. And if I can get at least four, and, and I think I might have five. If I have five more of these sold, he said, I'll feel pretty darn good about being able to bring you on. We'll have enough kind of capital and some of the profit from those machines that I will feel much more comfortable about bringing you on because he was in his own right, I, I don't want to say terrified, but he was definitely scared about saying, hey, I'm going to take a guy, his family, his security, pull him away from all of that and say, here's a job. And a year from now say, sorry, there's no more job. I don't blame Dave for feeling terrified if he did feel terrified for that. His wife, Shelly, probably was kind of like, are you nuts? When I sat down with Dave and I said, I'm, I'm not just an accountant, Dave. I know I could, I'm like, I could sell this machine. I can, I can introduce people to it. I can run the machine. In fact, I was very hands-on. In fact, I just said, just give me the chance. I'll show you that I can do this. And it was not desperation, but it kind of felt that way to me. And I, but at the same time, I think it was what Dave needed because Dave was just like, I can feel this energy, I can feel this passion. So he was the first employee and I actually said, okay, Spencer, I'll take you on. He came to work for me and he not only did accounting, but he wore a lot of other hats too. He got his hands on building machines too quite a bit that first year that he came in. But Spencer Douglas was, was a great asset when he came on and always has been since. The early years, it, it just every day was like, it was, just adventure. That's all I can say. It was an adventure. I mean, what, on day one when I sat down with Dave, literally a hundred feet from here in that building over there, I sat down and, and he's just like, you're actually in Hans's desk. That's Hans's chair. Hans probably won't be very happy about that. <laughs> I was just like, well, when he comes, I'll just introduce myself. <laughs> he said, well, I guess we're going to have to figure out how to pay you pay you and pay me and you know how to do that right and I just kind of was like my heart sunk and I was like yeah I know how to do that but I was like gosh he's he's counting on me to do this I need to know what I'm doing and I got really scared that first day and then the next day I came to Dave and I said hey you know we need to look at this like do we have an operator's manual do we have like stuff that people and he looked at me and he was just like, yeah, we're gonna need that. 
And I said, you know how to do that, right? And he's just like, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll figure something out. And I was like, oh, sweet. Dave's as scared as I am. <laughs> and so it was like just every day, back and forth, we'd bounce this stuff off of one another. Yeah, so in, in the beginning, uh, I mean, it was uh, Dave, Spencer, and myself, Dallin, and Kendall, and, uh, and we did everything. <laughs> so, you know, when a machine, when a boiler door needed to be replaced, we hopped in the truck and drove it out to the middle of Nevada. I got halfway home from one of those trips and got a call to go to a, you know, to go back to another one. You develop a very good relationship with all your initial customers. I actually consider most of the uh, customers who I've dealt with uh, pretty good friends of mine by now because we've talked on the phone at length uh, at you know one or two o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, <laughs> my wife knows their voice as well um, <laughs> from, from me answering a call and, and them having to listen to me at. Uh, at one in the morning while I try to wake up to figure out which wire is, is loose or, uh, or what could be causing a problem. It was also fun, uh, you know, it's fun developing those relationships. I used to drive past the facility where we're at before we ever owned it, before we even dreamed we could own it. And I was like, ah, I want that place. I want us to own that building, <laughs> you know? And I was like, oh, though we'd have to sell a lot of machines to get that. And you know what? We did sell a lot of machines and we own that building and we've built it into something awesome. And that is, there's no amount of money in the world that's, that can make a guy feel good. But accomplishment just makes you feel like, you know, we did that. So in 2013, we had built steamers for a few years prior to that. And the guys, Spencer, Dallin, Kendall, may have been some others, said, okay, we have an idea, Dad. I said, what? They said, we need to do a 72-hour challenge. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, we want to we wanna set up so that we can bale hay for 72 hours straight without stopping and see how many bales we can get in that amount of time. One of my cousins, Cody Staley, we had Bracken Farms, Robert Holt Farms, and then the, the Jones Farms. So we had four operations lined up. We knew if we just had one, we'd run out of hay and way before the 72 hours was up. You know, a little before this, this challenge was gonna happen, we went and talked to them. They said, yeah, we're, we're, we'll, we'll do it. But it was really interesting because some of them, like especially the Brackens, were really, really gun shy. Howard, poor Howard, he was so nervous about us coming on and bailing hay with steam. <laughs> he was like, I don't know if we, I don't know how much we're gonna give you. At first he told us he would give us four pivots to do. Pivots about 120 acres. And we had to get our machine out there. We got a fuel truck from uh, Jenkins Oil here in town. They donated a fuel truck to keep us all fueled up. We got a water truck from Robert Holt Farms. We got a soft water set up over there at uh, Staley's, at Cody Staley's shop. And then we got all these guys lined up so that we could just roll. And then we got all of our guys together so that we'd have an operator constantly so we could just trade off and keep moving. We also bought a weather balloon because one of the things we wanted to do was have a visual in the valley that anybody that, that lived there or that was working there or that would come in from out of the valley that wanted to see this thing work, they could just go into the valley and see wherever the weather balloon was flying and they would just go to there and that's where we would be. We learned that Billy Barney, one of our employees, wasn't quite heavy enough to hold down a weather balloon in a 40 mile an hour wind. And so we were moving from one place to another on the, I think it was probably the third day or the, the end of the second day and so his job was to pull the weather balloon down out of the sky and tie it down to the chassis of the trailer so we could take it to the next place. Well, he, he made the mistake of untying it off from the trailer first, and then he starts pulling it down, and we see the weather balloon going down a little bit. It's like 300 feet in the air. 
and all of a sudden this big wind just is coming through and it was windy anyway the whole time we were there but and Billy he starts to kind of skitter across the ground holding the rope and then he panics and he just let go of the rope and there goes our weather balloon with the 300 feet of the rope on it and everything it just takes off into the sky and I go Billy what did you do and he said I was gonna fly away I had to let go anyway We've given Billy a rough time about that ever since. We also talked to the radio station here in town, KSUB Radio, and they came, they were gonna come over and follow us basically every day to kind of report on what we were doing, where we were, how many acres we had gotten, and if we'd reached our goal. We also planned out how many bales we thought we could get in those 72 hours. And I wanted to really push the envelope here, so I did the math and so then I could figure out, okay, in that many hours, how many strokes can we put and how many bales will that make? And we gave ourselves just a little bit of leeway, but we decided that we could do 4,500 bales. That meant 1,500 bales every 24 hours. We were down at Bob Holt's shop one day. And Randy Jones, he was a little bit of a naysayer, he said, and I'm a good friend with him because he lives across the street from where I grew up. He said, there is no way on the earth you're going to get that many, no way, because they'd been doing some big bales there too. And I said, no, I think we can do it. And he's just like shaking his head in his little way. He said, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. And then, right as we were going to start, Howard Bracken said, you know, I told you we'd give you four pivots to do. I'm kind of scared of that. I'm only going to give you two. So then I'm kind of scrapping like, oh man, I got to find some more hay. Anyway, the next morning at I think it was noon, we took off. After we did Howard's Field, the first one, we, were, we went on over to Jones's, I think, next, and then to Staley's, and Howard came driving up that, that next morning, and he said, you can bail all of the hay you want on our place. Not just the two pivots, but I'll give you four pivots, I'll give you all of it if you want to. And I said, well, we might not be able to do it all now because I had to find some other hay. But anyway, it was fun. So we, we kept moving and we got through every day. We meet, we met our goal. We did have one breakdown. So we were down for about two hours getting that fixed. We topped it every day by just a few. So by the, by the end of the third day at noon, when we, when we quit, we'd bailed 4,668 bales. So we beat it by 168 bales. So that was pretty close guessing. And that was counting all the travel time and everything in there as part of the 72 hours. So approaching our three day, I mean our second day. We don't even know what day it is anymore. We've been up, up all night long too much, all of us. So here we are. It's, uh, I think it's Friday today, if I remember right. I've been out here since, uh, since Wednesday morning. Well, here we are, morning of the, I don't know what day it is today. We are all so tired, we don't know what day it even is anymore, but the machine's going all right. Some of the benefits that came out of this 72-hour challenge is we filmed the whole thing and made a presentation of it that we put on our website. We had sold, I think, six machines by the time we were done over there. And it was all these guys that were just like so nervous about getting into the steamer market. The time came though when we found that in looking forward, we were gonna have some challenges getting to everybody. I don't know how many machines we had out at that time, but it was probably about three years in. And my son, Dallin, uh, he just said, we have got to change. We've got to look at a dealership route where we get more field support out in the areas where we are, we're gonna be doing this. And we were all like, no, Dallin, we can't do it. And we just fought him and, and finally, we gave in, decided it was probably a good idea. And that was another one of those real blessings that we finally got our minds seeing a little bigger picture that we were gonna need to take care of tech support, parts, sales, just service in general, setup, startups, all those things that, it was just getting to be too much for us to do from one place. Um, it's amazing to see the progression that we've had um, with all the dealerships that we have around the country and to actually have a support network out there um, to be able to service these machines and, and supply parts for these machines. We had just were releasing our 2015 model which had some ma major updates in the burner and stuff and 
that was the year that we decided to, to start dealerships. So we got a bunch of them going. In the meantime, we had sold one machine into Australia. So our international presence was just barely starting. Uh, a year before that, uh, John Ryan and Evan Ryan down in Australia. I mean, those guys were amazing because they took this thing clear across the ocean with not a dealer, with no parts of support. So we figured out a way to make sure they had what they needed. And that really, again, was one of those shifts in our thinking in our company, like, we can do this. We can go worldwide. We got inquiries from all over the world a lot, but since that time, our international presence has gone from um, Australia, where I think now with the 21 machines we sent down this year, it's gonna push us right up close to 60 machines in that country. We've got machines in uh, Canada, in Argentina, and in Mexico, and here in the United States. You know, we're just obscure little people here in Southern Utah, and it's been really interesting how much that what our technology brings to the table of being able to hydrate hay to an exact level to be able to monitor it and adjust it on the fly from your tractor seat and keep it right where you want it. As long as the hay's dry when you start, day and night in most cases, it's just a revolutionary technology and it resonates with these guys all over the world. It's kind of fortunate that, that opportunities present themselves in a way that you can handle each one as it comes. And I really truly believe that that's kind of a, a divine thing that happens a lot of times where, you know, when you're ready to go through a door, the door will be put there in front of you. The joy of working with Staley West is our customers and our customer base. Uh, they're, they're the salt of the, the earth, people that have their hands in the soil have uh, God in their heart and uh, it's been a, a pleasure to be here. You find the exposure to, to people all around the world. Uh, I had the opportunity of uh, traveling to Australia and, and the people there face the same challenges that we face here. Um, people in Mexico, the same challenges that farmers face here. And they're not, uh, they're not easy challenges to overcome. So when you have a product that can help people and help their lives, it makes it worth it to, to be in the industry. Our vision statement is changing agriculture, changing lives. And our mission statement is raising individual, family, and community standards while revolutionizing the agricultural industry. The way we do that is we build steamers and we revolutionize the agricultural industry, but at the same time, we're affecting communities, we're affecting families, we're affecting individuals' lives, whether that's employees or customers. I mean, I guess the people's life that changed the most was probably our own, just here on the farm, um, that there's, there's no way this farm would have been able to operate without a steamer. It, it would have been absolutely impossible to do this farm the way that it was done. And so having the steamer for us basically provided <laughs> the life that we lived as, as kids growing up and, and taught us a whole lot about you know, what it means to just be problem solvers and, and that kind of stuff. So what, what would this farm look like without the steamer? Uh, it is not possible. Uh, to run this farm without it. Uh, and that's a, that's not just a true statement, that, that's an emotional statement considering where we were before a steamer to now. The, the, it is just not possible. We would not be able to do it. It, it has changed so much of what we do that we, we could never go back. It's changed our whole lifestyle because it's made it so that we, we, can, we can bale the hay when we want to bale it and not dependent on the weather, not depending on the, the, uh, the weather that was due or not. So, I mean, just this two weeks ago, we baled hay in a 30 mile an hour wind in a hot afternoon and made a good quality product. 
well, uh, how can you beat that, you know? You can go to bed at night and sleep and not have to get up in the middle of the night and try to uh, be at, at the mercy of the weather. This way you got things under your, your control, not the weather's control. If it's gonna storm and if you have to get it done, you can, and you still got a good product at the end of the day. One of them was Ryan Schwabach. He said, he's out in New Mexico, and he was one of our early adopters too, but he, he told once of, of his wife was expecting a baby and, and he was right in the middle of the bailing season and normally he would just have to say, honey, you gotta go yourself. I've got, I can't go. I've gotta stay here and work while I can work because this bailing has to be done. So he told the story of this time when his, his wife had to go get an appointment just to check the baby and everything. She was getting quite a ways along and he said, I just shut the tractor off and said, let's go, let's go together. And she was like, don't you have to stay here? And he said, nope, I can do it when I get home. And it'll still be here and I can still bail that hay. So he went, went to the appointment, not only went with her to the appointment, but then he took her to dinner. And then he came home and she's like thrilled and got back on the baler and just finished his work for the day because he had that much control. It had rained and it set us back and the rain was gonna come again in a couple of days and it had just got to where it was perfect. And I thought, man, I, I hope I can get it. And I bailed 24 hours straight with one baiter, one steamer, and I did 600 acres and bailed the whole farm and got it before the next rainstorm hit. And I remember, man, you couldn't have ever done that. And the value was it was with, it made poor hay into medium grade hay to low end good hay. And I thought, wow, this just saved a whole bunch of tromping over the next crop because I got the next rainstorm. We got off stuff that uh, it just saved me so much money, but it, it works. And not only does it work, it works perfectly. Well, especially from the first, when I had my steamer, a lot of people was wanting to know what, what, what it was all about. They'd drive by and they seen this train going through the field and everybody asked me what it is and, and how it works and everything. And I'd, I'd always tell everybody, if you don't want to purchase a steamer, don't come right in the tractor with me because once you do it, you're, you're going to want one. There's no question about it because oh, uh, it's just one of those tools that makes your life. You get to, you get to bail your hay when you want to bail your hay and not when Mother Nature tells you you have to bail your hay. My, my theory is that if you don't want to purchase a steamer, then you probably had better never ride in one or, or see what it does. It's almost universal that you can just kind of see, see the light bulb come on when you get out there in the field and you start bailing the hay and people are nervous and they're afraid to put enough steam on there and then you roll through a couple of windrows and then all of a sudden they're out there feeling the hay and probing it and they're nervous as heck, but then the light bulb kind of comes on like, wow, this, I spent all this money and it actually works the way, that, the way that everyone's saying that it works and it happens time and time again. It's just been a great asset to, to me personally as, as well as to all the rest of the people that are using it. You know, we, we really do stand behind what we build and we love what we're doing and, and we're proud of that. We're proud that we're a little bit different from the norm. We're not, we don't, we are a little bit obscure that way. We don't do business as usual all the time. And I really like that that's the way that it is because it makes us unique. And I think it endears the people that invest in, in Staley West, invest in the company and invest in the product really feel like they're getting something special from us and I like that. I'm, I'm proud of it. One of our guys out on uh, one of the farms in New Mexico also, he said, you know what, I can go home and I can read bedtime stories to my kids again, which I've never been able to do during the, during the harvest season. He said, that time is really important to me and to my family. And those are, to me and to us, um, those are the basics of life that really, really matter. Go to a baseball game, go to a dance recital, go to church. Take Sunday off, because you can. Even though you could before, it might have been kind of hard to do it because you're going, oh my gosh, the hay's dry. Well, now you can. Keep the Sabbath. Let the Lord bless you a little more. All those things come into play. And it's awesome when you can see that kind of stuff happen, and we do see it. And we're, 
like I say, we are just so happy to be in that part of someone's lives that, that they get to do those kind of things again. It's just been a very interesting journey. We have our faith that really has played big into what we do. We've had this great land of America where we're free to pursue our dreams and to, and I know there's other great countries around the world too, and we have a lot of customers in those, but this has been a great place to be. You know, it's, it's been a fruitful and wonderful journey.